Hi guys, and welcome to the first part of this series on making a 3D Endless Runner in Unity. In this video, we will create the project that we will be working in, the player, which will move forward automatically and can be controlled left and right, and the camera, which will follow the player. For the sake of this tutorial, I will assume that you already have Unity installed, so if you don't, install it first, then come back here once that's done. I'll leave a link to another video on setting Unity up from scratch in the description. With that out of the way, let's get started. Here I have the Unity Hub open, which is where you can see all of your project, your current Unity version, and general things like that. I'm going to click on the New button in the top right, which will bring up a window asking us to specify a project name and a location to store the project. I'm going to name this Endless Runner Tutorial and specify a location to store it. Once that's done, I'll click Create. You'll have to wait for a minute or two for it to load. With the project open, let's just get familiar with the main windows that we'll be using in the editor. In the middle, we have the scene view. This is simply where we can see all the items in our scene and where they are positioned. The inspector on the right shows us the properties of anything we have selected. On the left, the hierarchy shows us a list of all the items in our scene. Down the bottom, in the project, it shows us all of the assets that we have available to use. If any of that doesn't make sense to you now, don't worry about it, as you'll understand what they all do after using them for a while. The first thing we're going to do is right-clicking the hierarchy and create a new 3D object plane. I'll right-click on it, select Rename, and I'll call it the ground. In Unity, the x-axis is left and right, the y-axis is up and down, and the z-axis is forward and backwards. Therefore, to make this ground longer, I'll set scale on the z to 10, and its position to 40. Next, I'll click on the camera, set its position on the z to negative 5, so it's right behind the plane, and its rotation on the x to 30, so it's looking slightly downwards. Finally, let's create a new capsule. So right-click in the hierarchy, go to 3D Object, and Capsule. I'm going to press F2 to rename it, and call it the player. I'm going to set its scale on the X and Z, both to 0 0.9, just to make it a little bit skinnier. Then its position on the Y to 1, so it sits right on top of the plane. If I drag it up and press play, you'll see that it doesn't fall to the ground. To add physics to an object in Unity, we have to add a component called the rigid body. To do this, make sure the play is selected. Then in the inspector, scroll to the bottom and click add component. Search for rigid body and select that. Now if I hit play, you should see the player fall to the plane. However, if I change the rotation of the player slightly, you'll see that it falls over. When the player moves, we don't want it to fall over, so I'm going to exit play here, scroll down to the rigid body, and expand the constraints. I'll check the freeze rotation boxes for every axis. This stops the player from rotating, meaning that it can't fall over anymore. I'll set its position back to 1 on the Y, then 0 on both X and Z to put it at the origin of the world. To make it a bit more visual, I'll right-click in the project, create a new folder, and call it Materials. Inside here, I'll right click, create a new material, and call this Player underscore Map, short for Material. I'll drag and drop this onto the player, then select the albedo, which is just the colour at the top. You can set this to whatever you want, I'm just going to go with a light blue for now. Now we're going to create our first script. Go back to the Assets folder. Right click, create a new folder called scripts. I'm going to double click to open it up, and in here I'll right click, create a new C sharp script. I'm going to call this player movement. Give it a moment to compile, and once that's done, double click to open it up in Visual Studios. Once it's open, we can delete these two using tags at the top, as well as the start function as we won't be needing either of those. Don't worry about what everything else means for now, let's just get right into writing the code. At the top, we'll create some space, then say float, 
speed and end with a semicolon. This is how we declare a variable. Float tells it what data to hold, in this case a decimal number, and speed is the name that we're giving the variable. We want to initialize this variable with a value, and to do that we just have to say equals and then our value. For this I'm going to put 5 as the default. This tells it to start with a value of 5. Finally, to edit it in the inspector, we will add the keyword public to the front. This just tells it that we want to be able to access this variable from anywhere, which you'll see in a moment. If we now go back to the editor, drag and drop this script onto our player, then select the player and scroll down, you'll see the player movement script, as well as the speed variable that we just created. You will also see that we can modify this variable right here in the inspector. If I go back to the script and remove the public keyword, go back to the editor and let it compile, you will see that there is no more option for us to edit the speed variable. I'll go back to the script and undo that, and then below this I'll add another variable which will be public rigid body, and I'll call this rb. Again, this just declares a variable, type of rigid body, which is the physics component if you forgot, and calling it rb for short. These are all the variables we need to get the player moving. So now let's go down, create a new method by typing void fixed update. For me, this auto completes. It may or may not for you. If it doesn't, just copy down what I have on my screen. Inside here, we'll say vector3 forward move is equal to transform dot forward multiplied by speed multiplied by time dot fixed delta time and under it we'll say rb dot move position open parentheses and inside them type rb dot position plus forward move and end it with a semicolon vector3 forward move declares a variable type of vector3 and we set that equal to transform.forward which is the direction that the player is facing multiplied by the speed then multiplied by time.fixedDelta time. The fixed update function that all of this is in runs at a fixed interval known as fixed delta time and defaulting to 50 times per second or every 0.02 seconds. This is to give the physics engine a stable base to work from as opposed to a frame rate dependent function like update. Multiplying by time.fixedDelta time ensures that we will be moving 5 units every second rather than every time the function runs. Again, if that doesn't make any sense, you will understand it after using Unity for a while. Just know that it's something we have to do. RB.MovePosition literally tells the rigid body to move its position, then we specify what position we want it to move to. This is equal to the amount that we want to move forward added to our current position. If we save it and go back to the editor, we should now be able to test it. All we have to do is scroll down and you'll see a rigid body slot in here. Drag and drop the rigid body component into that slot, and then we can save and hit play. You can see that the player starts to move forward. More apparent if we go to the scene view. Great. Now let's add some horizontal control for the player. For now, I'm going to be using the legacy input, but if enough people want to, I'll make a tutorial on switching it over to the new input system later on. Let me know in the comments below if that's something you'd like to see. If you don't know what any of this means, don't worry about it, but if you're feeling adventurous and want to try to figure out how to integrate it, go check out my other video on making a player controller with the new input system after this. It should provide you with a reasonable starting point. Now back in the script, we'll declare another variable. This will be float horizontal input. You'll notice that this isn't public, as we only want to set it within the script. In the update function, We'll say horizontal input is equal to input dot get access open parentheses and in quotes type horizontal. I'm going to end this line with a semicolon. To explain what this does, I'll go back to the editor, go to edit project settings, and then select the input on the side. If I open up the axes, you'll see a list of predefined inputs that Unity has given us. Horizontal is one of these, and if I expand it, you'll see that it's assigned to the left and right arrow keys, 
as well as the A and D keys. The left and A keys are both negative, meaning that when either of them are pressed, reading the horizontal input will give us a value of negative 1, whereas the right and D keys are positive, meaning they'll give us a value of positive 1 when we read them. With this in mind, we can now close the project settings and go back to the script. In the fixed update, underneath the forward move, I'm going to create a new vector 3 and call this horizontal move. I'll set it equal to transform dot right multiplied by horizontal input, multiplied by speed, and multiplied by time dot fixed delta time. Transform dot right is exactly the same as transform dot forward, except that it gives us the direction to the player's right. We can see that if the player has the D or right arrow pressed, horizontal move will point to the right, but if they have the A or left arrow pressed, it will point to the left, as horizontal input will equal negative 1. If neither are pressed, it will equal 0, as horizontal input will be 0. Finally, in rb.move position, I will also add our horizontal move. Now if we go back to the editor and press play, we can test it out. I'll press the A and D keys and the left and right arrows. It all seems to be working. However, when we play, we might want to move horizontally faster than we move forward to give the player more control. To do this, I'll go back to the script and add a new variable. This will be public float horizontal multiplier. I'll default this value to 2. When setting horizontal move, I'll multiply the whole thing by our horizontal multiplier. This means that the player will move horizontally twice as fast as it moves forward. Now if I go back to the editor and press play, then you'll see that the player moves horizontally much faster than it did before. Also with the camera, I set its position to 5 on the Y. I forgot to undo this when re-recording, as my original recording paused halfway through for some reason, so I had to redo this. The horizontal movement looked a little bit too fast for me, so I'm going to click on the player, scroll down to the script, and set the horizontal multiplier to something lower, maybe 1.5. If I test this out, that seems a lot nicer for me. Remember, you can use any value that you want. Finally, we want our camera to follow the player. This is really simple, so let's create a new c -sharp script, right click, create, c -sharp script, and call this camera follow. Wait for it to compile, and once that's done, double click to open it up in Visual Studios. We can delete the two using tags up the top again, as we won't be needing them. We'll need two variables. The first one will be public transform, and I'll call this our player. The second one will be a vector 3, which we'll call offset. In the start method, we'll set the offset equal to the transform dot position, so the position of the camera, minus the player dot position, or the position of the player. This is just a little bit of math that will help us keep the camera the same distance away from the player at all times. In update, I'll say transform dot position is equal to the player dot position and add the offset. Now, if I go back to the editor, I'll drag and drop the camera follow script onto our main camera, select it, and you'll see a slot for the player. I'll drag and drop the player from the hierarchy into this slot, and before I press play, I'm going to drag the game view over to the right, so that we can see the scene and game at the same time. I'm also going to zoom out on the scene view a little bit, so that we can see more of the ground. Finally, let's hit play. and you can see that the camera follows the player exactly. However, in Endless Runners, usually the camera stays in the middle of the track, even if the player moves to the side. To do this, let's go back to the script, and instead of setting the position of the camera like this, I'll replace this with a variable, type of vector3, and I'll call it the target position, target pause for short. On the next line, I'll say target pause, dot x is equal to 0. Remember, 
The x-axis goes left and right, so if we set its value to 0, the camera will always stay in the middle. Finally, we'll say transform.position is equal to the target position. Go back to the editor, wait for it to load, and then hit play to test. You can see that the player is moving forward, the camera is following the player, and it's also staying in the middle of the track as we move left and right. That's all we'll be covering in this tutorial. In the next one, we'll look at spawning the grand tiles endlessly. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you didn't, hit dislike and let me know why in the comments. If you don't want to miss a video, remember to subscribe and ring the bell icon. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.